Okay, so let's go over model assumptions in one-way ANOVA. When utilizing a t-test or ANOVA, there are certain rules that are in place. Uh, in, in other words, uh, a statistical test cannot be arbitrarily used. It needs to be used when a specific set of conditions are met. Uh, and this has to be done prior to the running of the analyses. So I've been talking about the concept of, Minova, of, of ANOVA, but now I'm going to be ta talking about the rules that have to be followed and what you have to evaluate before you run your ANOVA. Um, and the model assumptions for the independent t-test, if you're aware of those, this is going to be a very simple lecture because they're the same for an ANOVA, independence, normality, and homogeneity of variance. Independence uh, refers to the fact that uh, the selection of a participant is not dependent upon the selection of another participant, and that once uh, assigned to a group, that participant doesn't appear in any other group. So um, in a study where treatment conditions are utilized, individuals in a population should have an equal chance of being selected. But uh, often in social science research, we look at demographic characteristics, characteristics which make uh, random assignment impossible. For example, I can't randomly assign somebody to a gender. Uh, but I can ensure that this person's only observed once, that if they're in one group, they're not in another group. For example, a researcher wishes to compare two classes with respect to performance on a test. If one student was in both classes, that student could not be measured twice. That would uh, uh, break the, the independence assumption. Um, so uh, make sure that you're not doing uh, paired tests. We do have uh, repeated measures tests and paired observations, but uh, for the purposes of uh, the one-way ANOVA, uh, you can't uh, use those types of uh, uh, groupings uh, for, for this type of analysis. We'll talk about repeated measures ANOVA where you can do that. Um, so uh, the reality is, is that uh, independence is just a, a rule that cannot be compromised, and if it is compromised, then your results are likely invalid. Normality is concerned with the distribution of the groups being compared in the study. Um, in the statistics that we run, like in an ANOVA, it assumes that each group is normally distributed. Um, there are uh, various uh, formulas that are, uh, that, that are used to uh, uh, compute uh, normality, um, and uh, while measures exist for uh, normality, uh, for testing normality, um, in reality the consequences of, of violating the normality assumption are actually minimal. Um, and this is especially true if your design is balanced. If you have a balanced design, that means equal sample sizes in all your groups, you really don't have to worry about normality. So when you have small sample sizes, normality should be evaluated using the Shapiro-Wilk statistic, and we evaluate that at the 0.01 level of significance. In other words, if the p-value is greater than 0.01, then there's no statistically significant deviation from a normal distribution, hence you have a normally distributed group. If p is less than 0.01, then you do have a deviation from normality. That normality assumption is not met. So, if p is greater than 0.01, you've met the normality assumption and you can move forward with your analysis. If p is less than 0.01 in the shapiro wilk statistic, um, you may need to consider some other alternatives. For large sample sizes, when you have groups of 30 or more, look at the box plots because the shapiro wilk statistic is very sensitive to large sample size and is likely going to show that you have a non-normal distribution when actually it is quite normal. So for large sample size, you just eyeball it. Look at, look at your box plots. Homogeneity of variance is concerned with uh, within group differences. Um, when you're doing an ANOVA or a t-test, the researchers focused on establishing whether or not statistically significant differences exist between the groups. So the mean of each group is calculated, um, but most participants don't score the mean. 
and yet the mean is the only estimation of the group. So when participants do not score the mean, this is called error, and the average amount of the error in the group is known as the standard deviation. The variance, which is the standard deviation squared, um, is the amount of area estimated under the normal curve. Um, so we want these variances for each group under the normal curve to be approximately the same. All right, and the reason is is because we're going to pool these variances together and combine the variances uh, into a mean square within or mean square error term. So we want these variances to be relatively equal. And when they're not, uh, homogeneity of variance is compromised. For example, one group has a distribution which participants all scored close to the mean, but another group had a lot more variability and deviated quite a bit from the mean. Um, this means that the research is actually comparing very different groups. The groups uh, have a very different distribution and cannot be compared without utilizing additional uh, statistical procedures such as a, a Welch's uh, test or a, a Brown-Forsyth test. Like normality, when sample sizes uh, are equal among groups, um, t-tests and ANOVA are robust to heterogeneous variances. But when sample sizes are unequal and heterogeneous variances occur, the result of the ANOVA could be compromised. There are tests to address homogeneity of variance. Um, some tests are seldom used because they require balanced designs. And balanced designs occur very rarely in social science research. So we're going to talk about the Brown-Forsyth test and the Levine test. And the Levine test is the most common test because it's uh, the default in uh, SPSS. The Levine's test uh, is used to calculate the absolute value of the deviation scores from the mean. And then it runs an F test on those scores. The Levine test is the only test for homogeneity of variance available in SPSS. Other uh, types of uh, statistical software also include the Brown Forsyth test. Um, instead of using the mean, uh, the deviation from the mean, it uses the deviation from the median. And so it's uh, less influenced by, uh, uh, by outliers. Um, so if you have the opportunity to, to use a Brown-Forsyth test, it's not a bad test to use. In this class, we'll be using the Levine's test, and uh, we'll be testing uh, homogeneity of variances at the 0.01 level. So when p is greater than 0.01, the homogeneity of variance assumption is met and we can move forward. But if it's less than 0.01, the assumption is not met and we need to consider other alternatives, such as whether or not the ANOVA is a liberal or conservative F-test. A conservative F-test occurs when groups with larger sample sizes also have larger variances, and groups with smaller sample sizes have smaller variances. So, for an F-test to be conservative, uh, group 1 has to have a larger sample size than group 2, which also has to have a larger sample size than group 3. And the variances in group 1 should be greater than the variances in group 2, which should be greater than the variances of group 3. So, if you found heterogeneous variances, so P was less than 0.01, and your ANOVA showed the following result, that... Uh, that the statistical test was not significant. We would know that our p-value is actually lower, but we wouldn't know how much lower. So we wouldn't be able to interpret this test because we would have to try, uh, because it, we don't know how much lower. So we have to do an alternative test. However, if we have a conservative f-test and the result is not significant, we know that our alpha level is actually lower and so if it's significant, even with a conservative F-test, we, we can still interpret that effect because uh, our, our p-value will actually be lower than, than what it states. So a statistically significant effect when the F-test is conservative, even if variances are heterogeneous, is interpretable. But if it's not a significant ANOVA, 
with heterogeneous variances, um, then it's, it's it, then we can't interpret it. The opposite happens with a liberal test, a liberal F test. All right, uh, a liberal F test means that we have larger sample sizes paired with smaller variances. All right, and this makes type one error higher. So, um, if uh, the groups for uh, uh, our three groups are, lar are, are larger, but the variances for each of the respective groups are smaller, uh, and you don't meet the homogeneity of variance assumption, if the result's not significant, you know that you can trust the results because your p-value is actually higher. So you can interpret that test as not significant. But if you end up with a significant result, you got to do an alternative test because uh, if p is less than 0.05, you know that the p-value is higher, but you don't know how much. So a liberal F test can be uh, understood if the result is, non is not significant. So if the F test is deemed conservative and you have a statistically significant difference, you can trust the result. If the F test is deemed conservative and you do not have a statistically significant effect, you must use an alternative analysis. For a liberal F test, if it's liberal and you don't have a statistically significant result, you can trust it. But if it is significant, then you've got to do an alternative analysis.